Well, fast becoming one of our regular contributors here to MTTV is our man, Mr. Weber, who's down in Guernsey. And uh, it's with news that you've had a meeting with Andrew Mitchell, M -H M -M I'm going to say MHK there, but MP. Um, of course, one of the people who's very much in involved in uh, trying to get the Crown dependencies in line with the UK on legislation. Over to you. How did it go, the meeting? Well, yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to have a meeting to to get a political commentary update and also at the same time uh, get a bit more information and see if I could uh, give any ideas for assisting with the way forward. Uh, because, of course, I've spoken to a number of people uh, in the Crown Dependencies and the financial sector, and I took the opportunity to put those points of view across to Andrew Mitchell and I think uh, that there was a better understanding of the, the, that, that point of view. But I, I think it did make me believe that the approach of the Crown Dependencies, we're talking about the approach of a, a few politicians on this matter, does need to be reviewed and debated. And uh, to give an example, if you look at how the way the UK government has negotiated Brexit, there's been a lot of criticism and people have said it could have been done a lot better. Now, what I'm saying is the Crown dependencies could uh, deal with this issue in, in a lot more, you know, more productive way. And it doesn't uh, help our cause if we go into these issues sort of saying to the other parties they don't know what they're talking about and uh, they're sort of overdoing things on the constitutional side. You've got to really stick to the issue in question, which is uh, the issue of uh, public registers of beneficial ownership as opposed to private ones. And there, there's some good arguments put forward on both sides, but there needs to be a way of moving forward so that there is agreement and that there has to be understanding of the UK's point of view that they're responsible not just for the UK, but the overseas territories and the current dependencies. And clearly on the international stage, they want to say that all of the areas they're responsible for uh, are well regulated and there is some commonality. So uh, somewhere there, there's an opportunity for um, some uh, compromising. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, the, the way it's done so far is, is not been very successful. Yeah, but Mitchell and Hodge have both done the Crown Dependency. They've done all three islands. They, they, they haven't changed their mind, have they? I mean, they've been given the charm offensive as best they can. but then they're, they're still adamant what they want to do. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that I think that's pretty true, and I, I believe the issue will come back at some stage. Uh, although, of course, if Brexit doesn't happen at all, um, things could be further delayed. And of course, uh, they are delayed at the moment. But one, one of the problems really is that the Crown dependencies are fairly good, bar. Uh, London offices and visits and so on in influencing UK government policy on a number of issues which affect the Crown dependencies. Where they clearly have very little influence is with the 650 MPs. And this is where we have a failing because it really is time to review the issue of having our own MPs because if we had our own MPs, uh, like... Uh, I, for instance, was sitting in Andrew Mitchell's office, I thought, well, if we had our own MPs, they'd be interacting every day with all the other MPs. Yeah, they'd that, be that, that'd, be, to... that'd be three MPs, right? There'd be one for the Isle of Man, one for Jersey, one for be... Guernsey. I don't think Sark would get yeah. one. <laughs> yes, one, one for the Isle of Man, Guernsey and Jersey, although there's possibly an argument that the Isle of Man and Jersey could have two but let's say it's one each and we know through the situation in the uk parliament at the moment that even one two or three votes makes a huge amount of difference so uh and we know that the the dup for instance with 10 votes uh influence government policy so uh and it, it's been well known in the past uh a former uh labor coalition they are hanging on to power with just a couple of votes so uh, if we had MPs, we couldn't just influence day-to-day -day parliamentary policy and um, amendments like the one 
and Dame Margaret Hodge and Andrew Mitchell, but we could have an influence on overall policy, uh, not just to help the UK, but to help the interests of the Crown dependency. And what would hap what happen to the states? What happened to Timwald? I mean, the, the, you'd have two tiers of government, wouldn't you? Well, no, no because um, it, it, it's um, there, there wouldn't be any change to the, the status of the Isle of Man, Guernsey or Jersey. Uh, this would simply be uh, a, a means of having uh, constituency representation and uh, wouldn't affect the, the constitutional uh, issue at all. Everything would stay the same. It would simply be having a voice in the national parliament on issues which affect uh, the crown dependencies. And of course, there are many issues which affect the crown dependencies, defence, foreign affairs, uh, you know, many, many, not, not just issues such as uh, beneficial ownership. And it's very outdated to have a situation where we have to go cap in hand to the UK uh, parliament every time an issue which comes up which affects us. We, we should, in a democracy, be able to have our representatives, representatives in the UK Parliament to, okay. to speak up an, for An us. interesting thought. But back to your meeting, did you get anywhere? Did, was there any sense of them understanding anything different to what they already, you know, already pre-proposed? I, I think uh, the, the result was uh, a better understanding of some of the very reasonable points which have been put forward about our high standards of regulation and our compliance in a number of areas. And uh, I, I, I did reinforce the issue. The, the, uh, the, in fact, the Crown Dependencies have themselves offered to um, assist with the UK updating their financial uh, standards in the areas where they're behind the crown dependencies. But at the end of the day, um, there has to be some respect from the crown dependencies on this issue of public registers of beneficial ownership. The, there is a determination on this one, and there's no point in upsetting the UK parliamentarians on this one. I, I think a better tactic would be to say, well, we could potentially lose a lot of business. We didn't go down this road in the first place without your connivance. So therefore, we want to have some compensation. And that, that might forestall things a little bit. But to go against the actual principle itself on sort of trumped up constitutional um, reasons, I don't think is the best way. And I, I would certainly appeal to those involved to look at better ways of dealing with the, the UK government where we don't get people's backs up and we get parliamentarians supportive of, of our, our point of view. Uh, so so that, that's really um, the, the, the feeling I had. And I, I, I felt having met Andrew Mitchell that if he'd had day-to-day -day contact with Crown Dependency MPs, I don't think his amendment would have even come up in the first place. I think there would have been agreements. And at the end of the day, uh, I would say both the UK parliamentarians involved and indeed the UK government, they always prefer the Crown Dependencies to update legislation themselves. This has only been a, a last resort. So I think making such a huge constitutional issue of this is, is certainly not the way to, to, to actually get agreement.